today's episode of the Grow Remote Show. My name is Joanne Mangan. I'm the Employers Lead with Grow Remote. Uh, this is episode three of the Grow Remote Show. If you want to check out the other episodes, you can find them on our YouTube channel, or you can also find us on Spotify. Just search up Grow Remote. Um, if you want to know more about Grow Remote and our mission, you can also find us on growremote.ie. So today we're talking about how to build inclusive remote and hybrid teams and inclusion in the workplace has always been a really important topic, but the move to remote and hybrid working has definitely brought it into a greater level of focus. Uh, some people think remote work has great potential to be a leveler, to bring more people into the workplace, to make the workplace more inclusive, uh, while others warn there is potential for companies to become less inclusive especially if you have some people working remotely and some people working in the office. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm delighted to be joined on our panel by two brilliant guests. We have Linda Hines, who is employment law partner with Lewis Silken, and Max Forrest, who is a smart working manager with the ESB. So you're both very welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you. So I just want to remind everyone, you can ask questions anytime in the chat. Uh, just raise your hand and we have, or just type it into the chat. And we have Grania and Graham on hand and they're going to keep an eye on the chat. So please do feel free to ask questions at any time if you have any for our guests, okay? So Linda, I'm going to start with you. Um, and I think maybe we'll start with a more general conversation about remote and hybrid working before we get into the topic of inclusion. Um, so based on your work uh, as an employment lawyer, what are you seeing as the main challenges um, that employers and your clients are navigating at the moment, particularly now that we're at the stage where offices are starting to open up? Thanks, Ron, and welcome everyone to my spare room in the true spirit of remote working. I am dialing in from my spare room in Dublin. I, well, so it's been a busy two years, I think, for a lot of our clients would be employers, and it's been a really busy two years for them in terms of all the different things that they've had to navigate. But certain, certainly in terms of specific legal challenges with remote working, we're seeing um, issues around, I suppose, one of the first ones would be around the organisation of working time. And, and that has been kind of tricky for some of our clients in terms of wanting to provide as much remote opportunity as possible and as much flexibility as possible for their staff to give employees control of what they do and where they do it to try and suit their personal lives. We're seeing a lot of that, but they still do need to think about maintaining working time records. And I'm not sure our current working time legislation actually is fit for purpose in terms of the new working environment that we're in. Um, but those working time records still need to be kept. And it can be a tricky kind of trust exercise in terms of having to go out to your staff and say, we need to keep records of your working time, but we fully trust you. It's not that we want to know what you're doing and when you're doing it, but we have to keep these for a legal obligation. So it can be difficult when you're asking those questions that there's a perception that the employer doesn't trust their team member. Uh, it's also important when you're looking at things around working time that we do have a right to disconnect and a code of practice around the right to disconnect now and that needs to be brought into play in terms of your employer policies as well. I think one of the other big topics that we've seen really come out over the last two years is health and safety obligations in terms of remote work so that's received a lot of press and we've heard horror stories of people having to work from their ironing boards and from their cars when they didn't have good wi-fi I suppose when we were in an emergency situation, there was a little bit more leeway in terms of how those things were managed and people were just getting by. But really now that we're looking at kind of the new world of remote and hybrid working, there is an obligation on employers to make sure that people have a correct workstation, that they have the right equipment and to minimise those health and safety issues. Now, employees, of course, have their own obligations in terms of making sure that the working environment um, is safe. So it's really important for employers to look at all the resources that are out there. And I would say, I, I hate coming to the lawyer being like, here's all the bad news. There are amazing resources out there. So in terms of, if you look at the health and safety authorities website, they have great support in terms of the type of health and safety measures that you can put in place and lots of checklists and templates in there that would be really good. Um, you can't really talk about this topic without talking about data protection as well and information security. And those would be quite high on employer agendas when they're looking at putting remote working arrangements in place. I think one of the key thing is to really look at what kind of training are you giving your staff and does it actually reflect the fact now that we have hybrid and we have remote working environments and making sure that that training is fit for purpose and not just a paper exercise that's being rolled out. 
I think outside of legal obligations then as well, employers need to be mindful of employee relations issues. So, and I think that's probably going to, where we're straying into our inclusive topic as well, because it's going to be important for people managers to make sure their team feels connected and engaged, and that will reduce the potential for remote workers to feel isolated or unconnected, because there would be a risk if someone feels isolated or unconnected that, well, firstly, from a talent retention perspective, it could be difficult to keep them. But then also from the legal perspective, you could have grievances happening between colleagues where they feel maybe they're being ignored or not engaged because of remote working arrangements. And that ultimately could lead to potential constructive dismissal claims. Um, a constructive dismissal claim, just in case anyone isn't aware, is where someone feels they have no option but to resign based on the conduct of their employer. Now, obviously those are absolute worst case scenarios, but people feeling isolated and disconnected can snowball and lead to those types of issues. So that's just very high level, some of the topics that employers need to be mindful of. Would you say then, because there's a lot of challenges, right? And, and whenever we talk about employers, we, we always do tend to go to, straight to the challenges. Um, but I, I think employers also do recognize that there's a lot of opportunity in terms of remote working. Um, just based on your own clients and people you work with, would you say there's an appetite, a positive appetite or attitude towards remote working from employers or are they still a bit wary and hesitant and sort of feel a bit backed into the corner with it? I, I would, I think it's, there's an element of it can be a little industry specific. So I think there's certain kind of client facing industries and financial services industries where they may be a little more reluctant for various reasons. The majority of our clients um, are tech clients and they have all been embracing this um, really well. And in fact, you know, even in terms of the right to remote work, the right to request remote work that we're expecting to come out by the summer, the ship has almost sailed for a lot of our clients in that they have been looking at putting policies and arrangements in place probably since March 2020 when this initially started happening or were maybe even looking at it before that. So I think there's a really good appetite for it. I think also, and I'm sure Mags will touch on this as well, from a talent attraction and retention perspective, it's it's pretty much the norm now when you're interviewing anyone that the, one of the first questions they will ask is, what are the opportunities for remote work in this role? So it really is something that people have to be on board with, no matter what your industry is. Great. And Max, I'm going to move on to you now. Um, ESP are, are working, their policy is called the Smart Working Policy, um, which is, is bringing in some measures where your staff can work remotely and somewhere they're in the office. Can you tell a little bit about that policy? How does it work? And, and where did it start? Where, where did it come from? Was it a reaction to the pandemic or was it something you were looking at before? Uh, and where is it today? Sure. So look, good afternoon, everybody. Delighted to be here um, talking to you. So we in ESB, we had actually been thinking a lot about the way we worked before the pandemic. Uh, we've been thinking about our people strategy, supporting our brighter future strategy. And we've been thinking you know, as part of that, we've been thinking a lot about diversity and inclusion. So we've been thinking about trust, empowerment, flexible ways of working, talent, all that kind of stuff. And then the pandemic hit and look no more than everybody else in the call, we had to rapidly rewire our business. 4,000 employees get them set up for working at home. And of course, we have a lot of colleagues in ESB who work at, at, at a site or at an asset. So we've, we've a mixed demographic in terms of employees and the types of roles that we have. And while that was challenging, we did recognize that it really was a once in a generation opportunity to accelerate the change that we've been thinking about anyway. So we set up the smart working program. And for us in ESB, so, you know, people call it smart working, the future of work, remote working, hybrid working. But what it means for us is we really wanted to shift the conversation and widen the conversation away from how many days per week in the office, which we feel is a kind of a narrow conversation. So we looked at it, we took an experience led approach and a people led approach. Um, so we, you know, we've hundreds and hundreds of data points in terms of internal data, external data, and we looked at it across three dimensions. So the first one was culture. And, you know, that's a slippery fish, right? What does that mean? But we have a great culture in ESB. You know, we have a very kind of welcoming kindness. We really care about each other, great sense of belonging, sense of community, you know, great values. But we can always enhance it, uh, enhance our culture. So we, you know, thought about, you know, managing outcomes, not ours, you know, empowering people, trusting people, that kind of thing. That was the first dimension. The second dimension was tools or the, the tools that we have to do our job. So like this is a good example of it. Two years ago, how comfortable would it, we all have been on a Zoom call being recorded, which makes it super inclusive. People can play, you know, hear it back, um, you know, on video, all that. Kind of, so having great tools. 
And the third dimension was the environment or the places that we worked, you know, picking up on Linda's point. So whatever that was a home office or an office office or a power station or an ESB depot in, in, in a town in Ireland, but having the, a great environment to do our work and an equitable environment. So that no matter where you were and what ESB location you were in, you would have the same experience. So in terms of where we're, and of course we joined the remote, the remote alliance and delighted to do so because we wanted to demonstrate our commitment and also work with like-minded organizations and do things like this to share ideas. So in terms of where we're at, so we have taken a principles and parameters based approach. We don't have a fixed set of rules and that's probably um, something I can talk more about. So, you know, we've said, we've said to people based on the service that you provide and the role that you have, here are some parameters or some guardrails to work within. Um, but then work out as a team what smart working means for you. Think about, think virtual first, but balance that with time together. Ours is a hybrid model. So we see the office as an important part of our future, but we recognize that how frequently you come to the office will vary depending on the service that you provide and the role that you're in. So in terms of where we're at, I guess the rubber is hitting the road, right? Because the restrictions are lifting and what was abstract is now becoming a reality. Um, so, you know, our offices are, are beginning to open. We've, in our large offices, we, we um, remove some desks and put in collaboration spaces. You know, in every location in Ireland, we've upgraded bandwidth and Wi-Fi, you know, so no matter where you are, you can have that tech experience. And we're starting what we're calling our learning year. So we say, we're saying 2022 is a year of learning. So for those of us who've been in, in force remote working for the past two years, whether we've enjoyed it or we haven't enjoyed it, we've gotten the hang of it. And what we're moving to now is, is something different again, it's hybrid. And it, we believe it's gonna be really positive. It will be more balanced, it's about balance, um, but also it's new. So we also think look, it'll be a bit lumpy and it'll take time for an equilibrium to emerge. It'll take time for us to develop all those inclusive habits. Um, so we're saying very openly, nobody's done this before. So we're all learning. So we're gonna keep the program active for 2022 and call it our year of learning and you know continue to to gather data and iterate to to uh, and we believe an equilibrium will emerge yeah and i think that idea of a learning year is is brilliant and is is really how companies should um should move forward because as you say a lot of this is theoretical um particularly with hybrid um working you know we had companies that were remote we would have worked closely with companies who were doing fully remote before the pandemic but this idea of, of widespread mainstream hybrid um, in a kind of systemic way is really quite new to everybody. So I think it's great. And I'm glad you mentioned the Remote Alliance as well, which is uh, a, a, an initiative we launched back in September for those of you on the call who aren't familiar with the ESB and Vodafone, uh, eBay and Liberty Insurance. And the whole idea of it is it's a sandbox for learning because none of us really know what the long-term impact may be. Um, and being open to just learning and experimenting is really important for, for companies. Um, you touched on something there, Max, just in terms of inclusion, I guess a big challenge for the ESB, I, I would imagine, is the, the fact that you have some staff who have to work in, you know, near an asset you mentioned, or they have to get a power station. Um, how do you balance that with, say, they're, you know, they, would they feel a little peeved that, that they can't work remotely? How do you make sure that their job satisfaction is not impacted by um, colleagues who may be able to work remotely. Yeah, I suppose a couple of a couple of ways. So first of all, yeah, like so we're a utility. Our business is the generation, distribution, and supply of electricity. So we have lots of site, what we call site based roles or asset based roles. Um, and I suppose one of the reasons that I said we wanted to widen the conversation was for that very reason. For us, smart working is a way more than how many days a week in an office. It's it's way more than that. It's about outcomes. It's about empowerment. It's about creating the environment for teams to self-regulate. It's about having fantastic tools to do your work and having that equity of experience, no matter where you are. And it's about having a great environment. So it's 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 not just for the people in the office; it's for everybody. Um, and what and you know um, and people have different roles, and everybody knows that you know depending on the role that they have, it means different things. For some people, it means flexibility of place. For other people, it means flexibility of time. You know, with people who can have flexibility of time.
who can't because of the nature of their role. So everybody understands that. And people generally have a type of role because it's the type of role that they enjoy. You know, a doctor is a doctor because they like being a doctor, you know, so they um, so so. But, but we really focused on um, why, you know, having a wide perspective rather than a narrow perspective. And what's interesting and maybe what you wouldn't expect is um, it's for our, maybe our more regionally based colleagues, it's been hugely beneficial for them because like what they're saying to me is they've never felt more equal, you know, they've never had, and whether they were office based or asset based, you know, just people regionally, they've never had so many opportunities to join webinars, you know, join things that they mightn't have had the time to travel to before, you know what I mean, they've never seen so much of their senior leaders. Um, there was a real kind of humanity to the pandemic in that, you know, whether it was the chief executive or the senior leaders, they were all at home in need of a haircut like the rest of us. So it really kind of humanized the leadership. Um, and what it also has done, which we're really kind of, we really want to um, embrace is that it has created a career path flexibility that maybe wasn't there before. So we would have a lot of people regionally based, you know, at a, you know in Money Point or in Ahada or Donegal or wherever it might be and they might not and they might not have considered a role in an urban center because that role was in an urban center because they're settled in the local community you know their family or whatever it might be but it's the roles in an urban center are least dependent on location they're the roles where you can have that flexibility so rather than it um, maybe our asset-based colleagues feeling like they're losing out it's actually improving you know um, because it creates this career path flexibility which in turn creates this equity of opportunity and equity of participation and that's one of the reasons why we're kind of passionate to make this work because you know, it's what's good for employees is good for employers, you know, and it, it, it creates access to a wider talent pool, both internally and externally, which, of course, leads to greater diversity and, and all that comes with that. Brilliant. And that's great. That is actually a really nice knock on effect that, that the colleagues who are in the regional areas have have access to a wide pool and have feel more included. And um, that's a really good result. So Linda, I'm going to go back to you. I was going to ask you about risks, but I, I think rather than being unfair on you and always asking you about risks, because you're in employment law. It's okay, that's, <laughs> partner, that's my life. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about opportunities. So if we look at inclusion, so Max talked a little bit about inclusion. Obviously, the, the topic of the day is inclusion in remote and hybrid um, workplaces. So are you seeing from your clients, are you hearing, or, or just from your own work, that um, what, what are companies saying in terms of opportunities for inclusion? Is remote work potentially or hybrid work, as Max talked about there, is it bringing more opportunity to people, maybe making workplaces more inclusive? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's really interesting to hear um, ESB's experience of it. And it sounds very, very positive. I suppose the one thing to say, and I, you know, I hate always being bad news, but, you know, the potential risks around inclusion definitely shouldn't undermine all the benefits that remote and hybrid working bring. It just means that there just needs to be some thought and some changes to old practices. And I think maybe a mind shift from maybe some traditional people managers and how they traditionally manage their people and just being live to that, that it is a new um, environment. So with our clients, we're seeing, it's kind of interesting hearing what Mags is seeing, because we are seeing lots of different, I suppose, arrangements and flexible options being rolled out. Like for some clients, we're seeing they've gone fully remote. And I think, you know, there's almost an element of fully remote is actually easier to manage because everyone is in exactly the same situation. So for those for those organizations, they've actually found that shift quite easy. And I think it's a good point you were making, Joanne, earlier about hybrid now is also in the mix and there's possibly more challenges in terms of hybrid, which will involve a mind shift by everyone involved in them. So we're seeing like, so for a lot of our clients where they're looking at flexible options, they're looking at, right, well, your role or, or your arrangement is either kind of office, it's hybrid or it's fully remote and you choose which one of those options you're going with. And there's different guidelines and tools available for all those different options so very much an employee chooses type of situation now again it, it's very industry specific but that's what we're seeing with a lot of them then we're seeing for some organizations a specific amount of time is being allocated to what we'll say we'll say it, we'll call it in face um person in in person time so for example it might be that there's 40 percent of their working week or two days have to be in the office or a certain number of days a month and then for some clients that FaceTime 
it doesn't necessarily need to be you're in the office. It could be you're having a team meeting in an offsite location or team members maybe even meeting each other for coffees or we're seeing a big increase in walking meetings where people are going out for a walk and chatting about an agenda item where maybe they actually live near each other and it's, it's easier to do that. So we are seeing our clients being very flexible around it. And I think um, I think it is quite fluid. So I think that year of learning is a really good way of putting it as well, because we have a lot of companies and clients who are testing out working arrangements. I think the key thing there, and particularly when we're thinking about inclusivity, is constantly testing the temperature with your teams to make sure that it's working, because sometimes silence doesn't necessarily mean it's working. You need to actually get in and ask the questions and say, well, what is working for you and what is not? And I think we need to see a lot of that in the next 12 months. I think in terms of managers, that's possibly, depending on your organization, might be something that they're not so used to is getting really involved in what would possibly be traditionally seen as kind of the softer side of, of uh, dealing with your team. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of support required for people managers in terms of, well, what's the best way to check in with my team? How do I know if something is wrong? What are the kind of signs where maybe someone is feeling isolated or not included? Those types of supports are important for managers. Yeah, really important. Um, I, you mentioned there the option of choosing that the employee chooses. And I that that is a really positive step forward, I think, for employees. But there's also, there's been a lot of talk in the media, particularly about this idea that remote work could become feminized um, mm -hmm. so that it would be more likely to be women, for example, women with caring responsibilities that may choose remote work or potentially if remote work is, is something that's seen as a, 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 a positive step for a person maybe with a disability or hidden illness, something that might have affected their ability to really thrive in that traditional nine to five environment. So if, if the choice, if it is chosen by the employees and there are a risk there that it would be certain cohorts of people who may choose, whereas others may choose to go back into the office and, and leading potentially to greater inequalities and, and also pitfalls for employers in terms of yeah. making sure that they aren't exacerbating inequalities within their own workplaces. So how do you see that playing out? What kind of things do employers need to watch out for? Well, and I think it is really important, and we might you might have heard this term in the media as well, around proximity bias, mm -hmm. so that the people, particularly where you're looking at a hybrid arrangement, the people who are in the office might inadvertently just get more opportunities for perhaps informal work that isn't distributed out to the remote team in the same way. And I think that's something that employers need to be very mindful of. So it's it's basically an unconscious tendency to give preferential treatment to the person who's in your immediate vicinity. And it's certainly something even as a manager, I'm trying to be far more aware of we're working in hybrid environments at the moment. I think it's that old saying of out of sight, out of mind is very relevant when we're talking about this topic. So like, just to be clear, it wouldn't be a manager looking to exclude someone who's not physically in the office, but it could happen very inadvertently. Even if you take, for example, in my environment, so, you know, we would constantly get urgent requests from clients and a colleague could be sitting beside me in the office here as I've just had an urgent call with a client that requires support and says to me immediately, can I help you with that? The easiest thing for me to do in that situation would be to just give it to the colleague who's just sitting beside me. It's quite easy to, to just, you know, start telling them about it and then they're involved. And that's an opportunity that hasn't been made available maybe to the rest of the team. And if it turns out that it's a really valuable project or a really good piece of experience, there is the potential then that that colleague has gained that experience that others haven't had the opportunity to. Um, so I think that's something we need to be really conscious of. Also, you know, the water cooler, the coffee doc conversation that can inadvertently lead to people just kind of naturally getting involved in projects that maybe other people haven't heard of because they're in the remote environments. We just need to be careful around that. And I do think it's something that has to be in terms of trying to avoid it. There is the there is the potential for further disparity in terms of things like gender pay gaps and diversity and inclusion for employers. So it could lead to indirect discrimination of certain groups. And certainly the research at the moment does show that um, it is certain groups that traditionally are uh, more excluded from the workplace that are a lot more likely to take up remote working opportunities. So I think it's really important that it is led top down. People need to see that their managers are also working remotely. 
people need to see that you know there are team meetings where we talk about okay here's the current project list who would like to get involved in this I think managers also need to start looking at the capacity of their teams more to see who's working on what is it fair is there a good spread of work across colleagues so all, all of those would be important to do because what you what you want to be careful of is that you don't create a situation where you're actually hampering your diversity and inclusion goals because managers are just going to the easiest person who happens to be sitting right beside them. So all of that is really important. Again, I, I don't think that should undermine all the benefits that we're going to get from remote working. It's just something that employers have to be live to and consciously try to reduce in the workplace. Um, are there things that employers could do to, um, let's say they see a trend that it is more their female staff, for example, um, who are looking for remote work where their, their male staff might be more inclined to be coming into the office. Is there anything they can do in that situation to try and address that or rebalance that situation? Or is it more a case of let's let whoever wants to choose it, choose it, and we'll, we'll figure out a way to make sure it's fair? Well, I think leading by example, I suppose, if staff know that the manager may also be working from home certain days, that's always a good way to do it. And I think actually sitting down with staff and making sure that they know they have these opportunities and that it is still going to be an inclusive environment would be really important. So leading by example and actually chatting to people where if they haven't availed of all the great flexible options, actually sitting down with them and saying, is, is there a reason you haven't availed of these have you any concerns around it? Uh, you know, things like th that the ESB are doing, we're trying to really encourage this for all staff and that there are actually opportunities that you mightn't even realize are there if you go for remote working. So I suppose consultation is key. And again, testing the temperature regularly on how people are doing and what, what options people are availing of. Great, thank you, Linda. And Max, I assume this, this topic is top of mind with ESB as well and has been in, when you were planning out your smart working policy, um, how did you say, how did you bring the topic of diversity inclusion into your smart working policy? Um, and what kind of measures have you guys put in place that can help mitigate against some of the risks that we just talked about? Yeah, look, it's a great question and it's a really interesting topic. So I suppose diversity and inclusion was at the heart of our smart working approach because we had been building on our people strategy and we've done a lot of thinking around diversity and inclusion. There are risks there, but as you say, you know, the, it's still it's still important to do it and just help manage the risks. So I would say we're doing a few things. So we're taking an experience and data led approach. So if somebody's having a great experience, they're having an inclusive experience, right? So we're constantly iterating, doing pulse surveys, doing brief. I've done 130 briefings in ESB in the last six months. You know, so we're out there talk, talking about it. You know, and getting data and getting feedback, and we're going out with ideas early and kind of iterating. So, and we will continue to do that through our learning year. I think with hybrid, what all of, the, well, it's new and we have to learn, but all of the thought leaders and all of the research and externally will say is that you need to be really intentional and really deliberate with your behaviors. So we're really focusing on that and we're really talking to our senior leaders around that. And then what we've asked teams to do, so we've taken a chart, um, each team in ESB is, is doing a charter, which is a very simple one slide. And what there's, what they're, what we're saying is here's some parameters, you know, you still have a base and we still need you to come to the office, you know, typically weekly, but you guys figure out what it means for you. So we're saying based on the business need and the team need and the individual preferences, just agree a charter. And it's really simple. It's what are the things we're going to continue to do virtually that have worked well. And there's lots of meetings that are much better virtual, you know, operational time type meetings. These kind of meetings that are really inclusive, they can be recorded, people can hear them back, you can have, reach a wide audience. So there's lots of things that is good, done well virtually. So what are the things as a team you're going to continue to do virtually? And then what are the things you're going to come together for? Equally, there are things that are better done in person. So if the outcome is unknown, you know, if it's a strategy session or a brainstorming session or whatever it might be, that's better done in person. We believe meeting in person is important from a kind of a culture point of view because we're all missing each other and that serendipitous network, that water cooler network, you know, that we didn't have. So it's important to come together for that. So what we're saying to teams is what are the things you're going to continue to do virtually and what are you going to come together for? And while you need to constantly review that to let it equilibrium emerge, we want you to commit to that, right? So in my own team, we've said we're going to come in on a Monday. Um, we're going to um, all be in on a Monday between 10 and 4. 
So we're giving people flexible. This and this is only an example now of one team in ESB of the hundreds of teams, right? But we're so we're keep giving people flexibility at the top and tail of the day. If you want to drop kids, if you have elder care, if you want to play a sport, if you you're for long commute, whatever you want to do, take some flexibility at the top and tail of the day. But we'll try and come in on a Monday. Um, and but we're saying commit to that then. So it's really important that but you know whether you said it was once a week or once a fortnight or whatever you said that you commit to that. And equally. For the other days then where you said you would do it virtually that you commit to that right so that people because people need flexibility but they also need predictability um, um so we're saying do your charter and then keep it constantly under review and we will like we will we will um we will monitor throughout the year we will get that feedback we will see you know um what where are the issues where where are the where are the points where people maybe aren't having a great experience and we will we will iterate we're talking a lot now about hybrid habits you know even having an inclusive meeting if you're having a hybrid meeting um like we're saying think virtual first but uh, but have time together but we all know that you know you'll have high there'll, there'll be hybrid meetings where some people are in the room and some people are joining remotely so we want every meeting to be an inclusive meeting so we're you know we're advocating no you know whether you're in the room or not join the meeting on your laptop without audio so that everybody's in the same little window on the screen and you know that kind of thing so it's not you can do around hybrid habits as well to to um you know make it an inclusive experience yeah and that's a really good one i experienced myself firsthand being the only one dialing in from home in a meeting and trying to shout at everybody to be closer to the speaker so I can hear so I can be heard and it's really challenging so making sure those they seem like little things but they're actually really big things in terms of making people feel like they're included you've you've told both of you have mentioned some really good tips I think the lead by example that you said Linda is is so true if your manager is still in the office every day um it doesn't matter how much they tell you you can be working flexibly you really feel like you may feel like you have to be in the office beside your manager if you want to progress your career and I think Max but you talked about the consultation you've done with your staff and your teams is, is really important as well. And that's making sure you have a voice, that everybody has a voice and that you're gathering the voices of different people who may have different situations, um, which is really important and helps build a more inclusive environment overall. Have you have you seen, Max? Um, it's probably early days yet, I know, because you're really only getting to, to get this um, new, new program up and running now that the offices are opening. But what kind of positive feedback have you gotten from staff um in terms of the program itself and is there anything specific around inclusion that you'd be able to highlight yeah i suppose what we've seen is you know while the pandemic has been difficult and it's been difficult for everybody and everybody has their story um you know it has presented us with this once in a generation opportunity and like what, what i say is it's really really rare that something comes along and it's good for everybody you know it's good for employees if people can have a bit more flexibility a bit more autonomy they're more engaged they better work-life balance it leads to, like i talked about equity of opportunity equity of participation career paths you know so it's, it's a win for employees and of course we all know what's good for employees is good for business right you know so employees are more engaged they give great customer service they're more productive it leads to greater inclusion which in turn you know widens the talent pool both internally and externally something very close to our hearts in esb is it's more sustainable you know um and we, you know we're we're working hard to deliver a low carbon sustainable future for, for all of the communities we serve. So if we're traveling less, we're safer, it's more sustainable, it's good for society. So I think we we in ESB we talk a lot about the why and that this is good for everybody. Um, and that's why we're we're trying to, there's a great Harvard, Harvard Business Review article which says to, to change a culture, you need a movement, not a mandate. And like we have that movement. So what we're trying to do is you know, find find a, a solution to that with, with all the complexities that are there that's that is good for everybody and delivers on all those benefits so i would say the the feedback we've had has been um really positive in the approach so we took an experience-led approach a people-led approach we went early and often right and that was painful for me personally at times because we got lots of feedback good and bad but i had to i, I had to walk the walk um, and lead by example so we're talking early and often we're iterating and so people feel really um, part of the solution, right? They feel listened to and they feel um, they feel trusted, you know, um, they feel like, you know, we're saying based on the on for the team charter, you know, based on this, you know, the business need and the team need and the individual circumstances, have a conversation to see like, what might this work 
how might this work for you guys? So people really welcome that because they feel that they're kind of, well, they might not get everything that they want because, you know, at the end of the day, we have a business to run and targets to deliver and all that good stuff. They're part of the conversation. Um, so, you know, they've been given a voice and teams are being trusted to find that equilibrium. So I would say, so that's the feedback so far. I would say, like we're, we're saying, our year it's our year of learning. We expect it to be lumpy and bumpy. There'll be things that we didn't think of, right? There'll be, we'll have too many too much space in one location and we won't have enough space in another location you know there'll be wi-fi black spots you know there'll be all that kind of stuff and there will be even for the teams themselves it'll take time for to find that balance you know we're trying to say like find that balance um but that will take time and i suppose that's why we're trying to be really open and transparent to say look we know now this is going to be a bit lumpy but it's good for everybody it's it, the feedback is we all want it um so let's let's kind of be kind and be patient and um, work together, and then we'll 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 find a solution. Yes, thanks. I'm I'm watching the chat, and I know Graham is doing brilliant work here and um, capturing some notes and and highlighting a few key points. I think there's a couple of questions in there too, either Graham or Bronya. If you want to uh, shout one or two of them out there. Yeah, thanks, Joanne. Uh, some brilliant insights, Mags and Linda. Thank you both. A um, couple of questions. Um, first one, I'll, I'll just read the question and, and you can decide who will pick it up. Um, what do Linda and Mag see as training skills that are critical to enhance team cooperation and involvement um, other than the usual communication? Will I take that, Linda? Um... Yeah, so what yeah, I would sure. say, so we, we're talking a lot about um, kind of adaptive leadership, Graham, or the whoever the question was, and how I suppose we're moving away, from, like we being the royal we organizations in general, or thought leaders, you know, kind of away from command and control and towards trust and empowerment. Um, so that's a different style of leadership and it's a different style of management. So, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about psychological safety, if you're familiar with that term. So everybody having a voice. Um, feel, you know, people feeling empowered to, to, to raise concerns, that kind of stuff. And we're wor working a lot with our managers to support them, you know, busy, busy managers who are trying to do everything. And now this is another thing for them to figure out as well. So how do we support them? How do we create scaffolding for them? You know, um, how do we help, help, help managers who are already really, really busy um, navigate this as well? So um you know so there's a lot there's a lot in that um so again we're trying to be just really deliberate and really intentional i don't know linda if you want to add anything well, to that or as someone who did an adaptive leadership course a couple of years ago i have to say there it's it's an excellent resource it's really good for challenging your thinking and i you know i'm coming from a very traditional law firm background where your suit jacket has to be on the back of the chair to show that you're in work so it really is a, a mind shift in terms of that I will say I looked at the Grow Remote playbook over the weekend and it is an excellent resource. Lots of really good tips in there. I think it's also important. So we've been talking about checking in with your teams and testing the temperature with them. I think it's also important that there is support there for managers that we're checking in with them. How are you finding it? I think your point is really well made, Mags, about there is sometimes a perception, oh, this is something extra I have to do now. So it is very much about the mind shift and I think selling the positives to managers I think really clearly over the last two years we've seen people that are really productive when they're working remotely if not in some situations even more productive I can say speaking for my team they've really embraced remote working and certainly we've gotten feedback from our team that they feel like we would have always seen ourselves as very accessible the partners in in our firm but they feel we're even more accessible now because everyone's chatting on teams we're throwing ideas into the group that maybe if you were in an office environment you wouldn't have done before just because that was just not the traditional way to to raise things so it's it's certainly become i'm going to use the word informal but that's not the right word but people are, are have a lot more trust and approach with each other i think it's really important that everyone keeps a virtual office door open you know, as we would have always said in the traditional environment, you offer you, you you give an open door policy. I think you need to make sure your virtual door is open, but that does have to be balanced with managers feeling, oh, is this something extra I have to do? So checking in with them as well. How are you finding it? What are you seeing as the negatives and the positives? And then communicating that back to their teams. So it's a very fluid conversation. 
Brilliant, thanks. And I think the manager piece is so critical because your your people managers are the ones who really have to um, execute these plans and these strategies and make sure that their teams are taken care of. And, and that's really important today, especially over the last two years, and that the managers themselves feel taken care of and, and building trust um, between managers and teams is really critical. Um, I'm going to give a shameless plug here for Grow Remote's training program, Leading Remote Teams. You've touched on a couple of topics that are covered in that program, uh, particularly psychological safety, building um, effective teams, culture, communication. So anyone who's interested, just check it out on our website. It might get great to post a link. And thank you, Linda. Appreciate the mention of the playbook, which we launched last week for SMEs. Um, I was I'm using it myself, I have to say. I, found, oh, I, I learned lots of interesting things in there when I was looking through it. So thank you. Oh, that's brilliant. So thank you so much. That's really great to hear that. Um, do we have another question in the chat there, guys? Yeah, another question, uh, Joanne. Um, again, it can be open for both uh, Mags or Linda. Uh, it's from Renata. Um, have we found that job roles or workflows have had to be adapted or changed uh, for working from home or hybrid? Uh, I might let Mags answer that because she might be able to be more specific about it. Obviously, I deal with a wide range of clients and in some instances there, there might be some adaptions, but I, I I would say generally on the whole, I haven't seen that, but Mags, I don't know, are you seeing that? Yeah, no, I wouldn't say for um, remote or hybrid. What we have seen is kind of digital adoption and digital democracy. So a lot of kind of um, more use of digital tools. Um, so roles have maybe changed or been made easier, you know, um, through kind of automation or streamlining of processes. And what we would have seen is kind of paper-based processes. Um, we digitized them very quickly once the pandemic hit, you know, ones that had been hanging around for a while that maybe weren't. But fundamentally, I, I haven't seen roles. You know, it's probably, there's probably an example somewhere, but fundamentally, I would say what's changed about roles is probably the tools um, and, the, and the technology has, has changed, but not kind of the fundamentals of the role, if that makes sense. Brilliant, thanks a minute. And we might take this one more, I think, in there from John, um, who just posted a question. Uh, John, what experience has the group had with poor broadband availability impacting on remote or hybrid working um, on a day-to-day -day basis? So I know, I mean, I guess that's, that could be a question for anyone on the on the group, but I, I, I am lucky in that I live in a, I have fiber broadband, so I don't have this as an issue, but um guys have you come across this either linda is it something that comes up through your clients or max has this become an issue in terms of esb staff um i i haven't seen it too much now i expect uh, obviously there's a going to be a legal right to request remote work coming in at some point during the summer i know it's still the topic of some debate as to to what is in there but i know one of the reasons for refusal in that um draft legislation is around availability of broadband and technology and that so it may be something that we see coming up in the next couple of months and um, not something that I've had um, come up as an issue through any of my clients at the moment anyway but again I suppose it's all very it's still very fluid it's everyone's still testing the arrangements and I think if it were to become a major issue then it is something that would have to be looked at by the employer in terms of how they facilitate that arrangement maybe looking at someone going working from a hub rather than their house or, or somewhere like that okay great um i want to ask you about that actually and linda while we have time um the right to request remote work just in terms of, of this idea of inclusion and, and equity i guess so there there are quite a lot of reasons um, in the legislation as it's proposed to for an employer to be able to reject a request. And I, I think a lot of people would argue some of them are a little open to interpretation, which potentially could lead to one employer saying yes to a request, whereas another one may say no. It's it's you know it, it's a little it is a little easy to interpret. Um, I think it might be fair to say. So how does that like what are you hearing from your employers, your clients? And are there are there certain things that, that, that they're are they supportive of the legislation? What um, are well, they getting? Generally, it doesn't seem to be really going down too well. So I am expecting that there is going to be some review done of it. And I know that the Tonishta has committed to taking the feedback in board. So I expect it will be slightly different 
once it has actually um, come into place. I also think a big issue with it is that by the time it's come in, most companies have already had to put some policy or arrangement in place anyway, because this is a live issue right now. As, as Mag said, all our restrictions are lifted. We have to make decisions now on whether people are coming into the office or not. Um, so I think the challenge for a lot of companies will be when it does come out, making sure well, like one of the obligations in it at the moment is that you have to have a, a policy in place about how you're going to handle uh, requests for remote work. So anything that employers have put in place now, they'll obviously need to just double check that they're still working generally in line with what the legislation says. And, and I think the key thing is there'll already be a lot of arrangements in place. So it'd be quite hard to row back from those despite regardless of what's in the legislation and people have been working in that way now for the last two and a half years. Um, I think I, I think it's a, I think it's a challenge for government in terms of they're trying to legislate for every type of role and every type of job and every type of industry. And I think that's what the what they're being called the 13 reasons is trying to reflect that. But I do think some of them are quite controversial, you know, things like if it's going to affect an employee's performance, you potentially can refuse it. How are we even going to determine that? And I know certainly the way it's drafted at the moment, complaints about the right to request remote work would go before the Workplace Relations Commission. But that's only insofar as the employer has failed to actually respond to your request. There's nowhere really at the moment to go to and say, I think the decision made by my employer has been unfair. That's really going to come down to the, the individual business and what they can stand over. So I think it's quite a difficult thing to legislate for, considering it involves so many industries. And they're, that's why I think they're trying to be as broad as possible in the refusal reasons. But obviously, that's not going down very well with various groups. So I do expect we'll see some changes there. Yeah. And what about, um, have you seen situations where somebody, well, I'd say a lot of people are feeling nervous about returning to the office, maybe for health reasons, anxiety about COVID, those kind of things, are they, are they coming up at the moment now that offices are opening up? Actually, I was just speaking on RTE Radio, shameless plug for myself there about this yesterday in terms of the mask restriction being removed. I think there will naturally be a lot of anxiety among certain employees, particularly if your employee is uh, medically vulnerable or lives with someone who's medically vulnerable. But it probably comes back to the same topic that we've been talking about all during this, which is consultation is key and actually reassuring people. So there's a, there's a lot, there's a transitional protocol, which is a little bit out of date because a lot of the restrictions have gone that were referenced in it. But it does have really good infection prevention and control measures in it things around signposting and high and hand hygiene and respiratory hygiene. I think if all of those are being implemented by the employer, then um, they, that should be giving employees some reassurance. I, also, I think a lot of employers are phasing employees back in very slowly. And a lot of employers are looking at hybrid working arrangements, which again should alleviate some anxiety because it's not a case of everyone is back in the office full time all the time. So um, I'd say for a lot of our clients, because they've been already looking at putting hybrid or remote arrangements in place, they're not seeing too much of that. I think you'll see it more in industries where people are being mandated to come back to the office full time. Okay, great. So we've just a couple of minutes left, so I might just leave the final word to Mags. I think it'd be really good, Mags, if you could uh, share some advice that you would um, be able to with some of the people on this call. Who may be thinking about hybrid or, or working in, in hybrid organizations so what kind of advice would you give based on your experience with the smart working policy that you have at esb yeah so i would say take it take an employee and an experience-led approach and um you know people will give you people will give you the solution and they'll they'll feel empowered and um, so I would, I would definitely say that benefited us um so we've hundreds and hundreds of data of data points now that can create complexity and it can be tricky, you know, depending on, and because this is personal and people have very, very strong views and very emotional views. And it's usually kind of based on their own personal circumstances or their personal situation. But if people feel they have a voice, then, you know, people are reasonable. At the end of the day, people want to do an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. You know, they want to, they want to do a good job and they want to support their colleagues and deliver on the organization's purpose. So I would say consult and be open. And then, you know, keep an open mind. Um, we were careful that, you know, our our approach didn't feel like it was cooked up in a lab or it was cooked up by HR or it was kind of cooked up 
by the senior people. So, um, you know, um, engage and then try try a few things. You know, we tried a few things early. Some things worked, some things didn't work, um, but but something always emerged. Um, and I would say, you know, take the business needs. So we always talk about what does the business need? What does the team need? And then how can we help individual circumstances? And if you can find, if you can use that triangle or keep that in your mind um, and have some guardrails, then we, we believe, I suppose we're confident that over time, while it'll be a little bit lumpy and it'll be a bit bumpy at times, an equilibrium will emerge and we'll all learn from each other. You know, the, and like, thank you for inviting me along today. These types of, of things are really super helpful because it's a way to share ideas because it's, it's new for everybody. So, uh, but a, an equilibrium will emerge and we've learned so much through the pandemic and we'll learn so much again now this year as we, as we move towards a different future. Brilliant, thank you. And I think you touched on it yourself, Mags, this idea of just being intentional and deliberate, not expecting it to happen organically, because it probably won't, that there is a lot of thought that needs to go into making remote work and hybrid work really work for your organization. So putting the time in now to try and plan as much as you can and, and test and experiment this year will hopefully reap the benefits and reach that equilibrium that you talked about. Um, I know, I mean, if we're remote, obviously we feel very strongly about the potential for remote work in terms of in inclusion, um, not, not just inclusion in the workplace, but the readdressing of the balance. And you talked a bit about this between Mags, between urban jobs in urban centres versus jobs in, in rural and regional locations in Ireland. So there's huge potential there. And I think some of the advice that both you and Linda have given us today is really valuable. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you everyone on the call for your questions. And thank you, Linda and Mags, for, for taking the time to speak with us today. It was a really enjoyable session, and we'll talk to you all again soon.